uh, back to our meet Friday uh, morning meetings. Today we're going to do part two of the CTG um, training. Uh, Dr. Verenga is going to take us again. So Dr. Verenga, please welcome. If you can start screen sharing so that we can begin our meeting. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Berenga, if you can start screen sharing so that we can start the meeting. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm already screen sharing. Let me see what's wrong with my screen. Because this I am yes, I see you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. 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 Verena. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. So, so I was saying, good, so let me continue. So I was saying last week that um, Sir, we can't hear you, Dr. Verenga. Mm. You guys can see my screen, right? <coughs> yes, we can see your screen.
I think uh, I think we are good to go now. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm getting rid of the other devices. Right, great. So I was saying uh, it is important that we understand the pathophysiology of the fetal heart rate changes phase. Because for us to be able to make sense of what we see on the CTG, we need to, to be able to understand how does the fetal heart respond to stress. First of all, there are uh, critical structures that we, we have to, to be cognizant of. We need to be aware that there are baroreceptors which are, which are here, which are found in the aortic arch and also the carotid sinus. Then we also have the um, the, the, the chemoreceptors, which are, we have the central ones, which are in the medulla oblongata, and also the peripheral ones, which are in the aortic bodies. So it is these two um, centers that sort of regulate the activity. For the fetal heart, um, there is a balance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which should be okay. But because uh, the sympathetic nervous system matures earlier than the parasympathetic nervous system, as a result, there is what you call a dominance of the sympathetic nervous system in early gestation in preterm babies. This is why the heart rate at the beginning is very high. The baseline fetal heart rate is high at the beginning of, uh, in the early gestation compared to late gestation, such that values of around 110 are normal for a baby who is 42 weeks, but this is not normal for a baby who is probably 26 weeks. It will actually be a bradycardia of some sort, even 115. If you see a heartbeat of 115 at 20 weeks, then that is a problem because the sympathetic system is the one which is overriding, which causes tachycardia, while the parasympathetic system causes bradycardia. So uh, it is the interaction of these two systems that influence how the baby behaves to both mechanical and also hypoxic stress. Mechanical stress is the one which may be caused by code compression, while the hypoxic stress is what may be caused due to uterine placenta insufficiency. So because we now understand this, it is important also to understand how the uh, baby behaves physiologically. So physiologically, <coughs> the baby behaves in such a way that uh, it goes into two periods of sleeping. There's what is called um, uh, non-active sleep. The non-active sleep, the baby is closing the eyes and uh, there is no eye movement for this, um, for this fetal quiescency. So because there's no eye movement for this fetal quiescency, um, what happens is that um, there is a reduction in the baseline variability. So we see a, a reduction in the baseline. This is fairly normal for, this is what is physiological for fetus is to say they go into a period of fetal quiescence. Then they, they we have what you call active sleep. Active sleep corresponds to this kind of a period where there is a good variation. We may see some few, uh, few accelerations there. This is a period of active sleep and there is rapid eye movement during this uh, phase of uh, sleeping. Then the wakefulness period belongs to a period where we see a lot of accelerations. 
So this is physiological. If you were to listen to the baby for to, uh, to a CTG of a normal baby for two hours or more, uh, because sleep cycles may okay for around 50 minutes. So this is what is normal. Um, if we understand the, what the, the normal is, then it will be it will be easier for us to interpret when things become abnormal. And uh, so, so this is what this is the characteristic of the fetal behavioral state or what we call cycling. Uh, the baseline will always be stable between 110 to 160. There may be little or none significant de uh, uh, decelerations, and we may see, we will see a normal variability. Then sometimes we see periods of reduced fetal heart rate variability due to the fetal quiescence. Then you can also see periods of increased variability with or without acceleration, both in the active sleep phase and also the wakefulness uh, phase. So very important to understand this, because sometimes you may listen to the baby while the baby is sleeping, and you may see this kind of tracing on a probably a low risk pregnant woman. A woman just comes and probably the only complaint that she has is she tells you that, look, I didn't perceive the fetal movements last night. I'm not happy with the fetal movements. You put a CTG, all you see is this for the first 20 minutes of trace. Instead of you jumping to the conclusion and say, look, your baby is in trouble, we need to go and deliver it. All you need to do is probably to ask the lady to, to sit up, to go and uh, probably uh, drink something sweet and come back, then you double check the CTG because the baby could probably be sleeping. But sometimes uh, taking cold drinks or taking sweet drinks will wake up the baby because the sugar, sugar causes the baby to be hyperactive. So this is what you need to understand. So if you see a low risk woman with this kind of CTG, please don't panic and say, look, this baby is no variability. This baby is not having accelerations and um, you begin to panic and uh, cause a lot of anxiety on the woman. So the context is very important and also understanding the physiological um, um, response of the baby, the normal physiological response of the baby or the normal uh, physiological CTG is very important in the interpretation of abnormal findings. Um, I think we did this with this group. Um, so I think we also mentioned this, uh, that uh, uh, while the, the, the uh, while the falling carbon uh, in, in CO increase in CO2 or uh, a falling partial pressure of oxygen causes increase in the heart rate, but what will eventually happen is that uh, the the baby cannot maintain uh, enough myocardial energy balance uh, by continuously increasing the heart rate, and the other thing is that the baby cannot breathe like what we do adults. Adults who start hyperventilating if we are getting hypoxic and so forth, increasing the heart rate, but the baby cannot do that because the, the mother is doing that job for her, for, for, for the baby. So the baby will end up reducing their heart rate to conserve myocardial energy. This is why the baby ends up decelerating uh, in periods of hypoxic stress. There may be a reflex tachycardia, but in most cases, the baby may not be able to sustain this cardia, tachycardia because of that. So we see a bradycardia. Um, This, I think we, we touched a little bit on it, but uh, to just emphasize what we've already said that um, um, if the code is compressed, which will result in sort of the, the blood pressure going up, this will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and we will see a drop in the heart rate uh, of the baby. Um, if this occurs in relationship to uh, during labor, you may see that there may be no relationship to, uh, to the contractions. This is called variable decelerations, which we, we described last week. Then um, if it occurs due to hypoxia, fetal hypoxia, um, we will see a gradual, um, a gradual fall, more of a U-shaped kind of uh, fall in the heartbeat on the CTG. And in most cases, this occurs after a contraction. Uh, we see this in, in, uh, in babies with the utero placenta insufficiency. You are going to see it more in babies with preeclampsia. Um, those with placenta insufficiency, especially the fetal medicine team, you are going to see those babies with abnormal doplas and so forth. 
um, this is this is the kind of strategy pattern that they will demonstrate when they are in, they they go into labor. Then the prolonged decelerations, which are more than three minutes in terms of the uh, the deceleration, there will be more than three minutes. If there are more than three minutes the deceleration, then in that case, um, we should suspect that there is now uh, umbilical cord prolapse. There is placenta rupture, uterine rupture. We should suspect all these conditions, including uterine hyper, hyper, hyper stimulation or hypotension, secondary to epidural or uh, hypoxia. Then, in terms of uh, what we see every day in the FMU, uh, we 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 see placenta insufficiency almost every day, uh, even outside the placenta disorder clinic. Those who even those who scan routine patients, you see a lot of placenta insufficiencies because of preeclampsia. So what is the actual pathophysiology of the chronic hypoxia, which is in most cases secondary to placenta insufficiency? In our setup, it, the enemy will be preeclampsia. So what exactly happened? Uh, happened so the, the progressive reduction in fetal oxygen um, due to the um, um, destruction of the uh, functional villi, uh, the percentage of functional villi is destroyed in, in uh, placenta disease. So there will be not enough oxygen to the baby. So this will cause the release of catecholamines, uh, and these catecholamines will cause redistribution of blood. This is the redistribution that we mentioned when we are saying there is a redistribution in the MCA. What we are saying is that now the blood is now being put to the to the brain and also uh, to the adrenal gland in the heart to preserve these vital organs, and we will see an increase in baseline fetal heart rate. So when we do CTGs in those babies, if we, uh, probably we may uh, end up doing a baseline CTG when these babies are still normal, so that we can see this uh, increase in the baseline heart rate that is experienced with chronic hypoxia. We we'll also see a reduction in the uh, fetal growth. This you have, we, you have all experienced this. It's not news to you, and of course. Something that occurs at the cellular level is something that we call metabolic adaptation uh, due to epigenetic changes. Uh, the metabolic adaptation is what you always told the parents that, look, if your baby is tiny in uterus, uh, please don't give them McDonald's, don't give them chicken in, make sure they participate in sports because they are at more increased risk of having metabolic syndrome compared to the babies who are getting enough. Because some of, some of their bodies as genes have been modified to be content with very little, so that what is considered optimal extra uterine will be actually be excess for the body's genes, so that the, the baby will end up generating a lot of fat tissue um, just from uh, a normal quantity of food that other people eat without having any problems. So this is due to the uh, epigenetics or metabolic adaptation that okay due to chronic starvation in uterus. So. Uh, so we will see a progressive fetal decompensation, uh, which you, uh, when the acidosis occurs, then we are going to see these shallow decelerations. Then when the decompensation phase occurs, I think we remember so where we say there is now a decompensation. When there is a decompensation, that redistribution in the MCA goes away, and we end up with an increased positivity index in the, in the MCA. In a baby with a deranged doplas, uh, absent to reverse uh, in the, the solo flow in the umbilical artery, and also a baby who is um, uh, probably uh, absent in the reverse A wave in the doctor's venosus and also in EDF in the uh, umbilical artery. So we are going to see a, a loss of the, the baseline variability. Sometimes these babies will end up with uh, flat tracing, a flat trace on the CTG. Then uh, from there, uh, due to the acidosis, Acidosis will will um, is uh, toxic to the cardiac muscles, so because of that, we are going to see a myocardial decompensation. I think some of you have experienced these babies, whereby a baby who is following up for Doppler, some or some of them are not done a scan. The next time you come, you see that they are now in bradycardia as you are doing the scan. This is exactly the process that is happening. That the, there is now myocardial decompensation. The heart is now being poisoned by the acidosis. And uh, once this happens, if you are to do a CTG, you are going to see a progressive reduction in the baseline fetal heart rate towards fetal demise. So these are some of the patterns that you may see with chronic hypoxia. 
uh, we are going to be seeing this more often because we, we see these babies every day. So this is a flat trace, more of a flat trace. We see there is some shallow deceleration, then the reduced variability, a flat trace in this segment, almost a flat trace there, and reduced variability, shallow uh, deceleration. This is a typical pattern of a baby who is undergoing chronic hypoxia. And um, uh, then in terms of uh, the other forms of hypoxia that we have to be aware of, because not all babies will have uh, um, chronic hypoxia. Some are going to have acute hypoxia due to the following events, such as cold prolapse. Uh, this is a baby who was otherwise well, everything was fine, but somehow, somehow they have a cold prolapse a uh, placenta, or they may have uterine rupture. So what are you going to see? When you do a CTG for this baby, or if this baby is away under a CTG, we are going to see this progressive decline in the fetal heart towards fetal demise. So this shape is not a very good shape to see. If you see this, you really need to, be, to take the most urgent action that you can do. Because the baby is, is dying, is dying. Um, if it is called prolapse, sometimes you can reverse this. How can you reverse this? You can put your head and push away the head, which is compressing the cord, and immediately arrange for delivery. Um, so, <coughs> sorry. So this is the kind of pattern that you may see. Sometimes you may just see that, uh, as well for placenta abruption cases before the whole placenta um, is peeled off, you may see that there's now a reduced variability and there's no more cycling. And, um, um, and there may be decelerations there that you may experience in cases of acute um, uh, hypoxia. So be aware of the features of acute hypoxia, where there's this sudden drop in the uh, baseline uh, as the heart uh, Dr. Vivenga, we can't hear you now. What happened here? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Right. So I was saying, if you see this, then check to see if... Um... Ch check to see if any of these uh, is present. If it is a woman who has a previous seizure, then you need to, to suspect that the woman is ruptured. If this is a woman who has... Okay, all the, check the abdomen for any evidence of abruption. Then, of course, check the code if you, you heard that the membranes have ruptured. If you are not sure, then quickly check and see if there is no code prolapse which is happening. Then we have what you call subacute uh, hypoxia. Uh, subacute hypoxia um, is normally associated with the way by the baby stays more in deceleration than uh, at the baseline. So it's always uh, decelerating. It's always decelerating, it's always decelerating, and it's really returning to the baseline. So this is what you see with, um, uh, uh, with the uh, subacute uh, uh, hypoxia. This may okay in babies with placenta insufficiency, the ones you have put on oxytocin. So you might want to stop the oxytocin and uh, to review again uh, what is happening. If there is no improvement, then in that case, you might need to uh, consider delivery. This may also be experienced uh, uh, in the second stage of labor where women are pushing too much. I think you are aware that when you are in the labor world, you have seen this kind of women who just push and push and push and push, even when there's no age to push. This may cause subacute uh, hypoxia and you may see this kind of pattern uh, on the CTG. Then compensated. Compensated, uh, we will experience this with women uh, who are having redistribution in the middle cerebral artery, because this is more of a gradually evolving hypoxia. And um, because it's gradually, uh, um, it's gradually uh, evolving, it goes through two different phases. There's the compensated phase, then the decompensated phase. 
the combated phase um, is what we you probably most of you commented on say the redistribution where we are saying the baby is adapted the situation it is giving itself oxygen and what do we how do we know that there is some um compensation we will see some decelerations which are pre, uh, which are followed up by an increase in the baseline heart rate so we are saying this is a baby we we were looking after before uh, and we knew where the baseline was where well, the baseline is not supposed to go to to rise towards 10 it's actually supposed to fall towards 10. so if the baby is the ctg before and people knew that the baseline was probably around 130 140 but suddenly you see this baby who is decelerating and when they recover from decelerations the heart rate goes around 159 160 then you know that there is this is a feature of a compensated uh, baby and we we, we will experience loss of contra um, or acceleration and for this kind of babies um of course we need to monitor it's not an indication to deliver but we need to continuously <coughs> monitor and do some conservative measurements like we may want to turn the baby the mother might want to check the woman's blood pressure if we think she's hypotensive you might want to give some fluid then the decompensated phase the decompensated phase, um, the phase is what we describe the way by the uh, PI in the middle cerebral will go up instead of going down. And there is loss uh, of flow or a reduction of flow in the end diastolic flow. Uh, in this case, we are again going to see a, a reduce or increase variability, the one who called the saltatory pattern. Um, then if nothing happens, then we're going to see um, a progressive decline in the baseline uh uh in the fashion that we see on the um on this picture there on this um ctg image there where there is a progressive decline towards death in a step ladder pattern to death then um chronic hypoxia i've already described to you when there is no hypoxia the ctg is normal but chronic hypoxia i've already shown you the images and i've already told you that we're going to see this more with the IGR placenta insufficiency from one reason or another. And we may also see this um, um, in women who are bleeding and so forth. But the most commonest cause of chronic hypoxia in our setup will be preeclampsia which, uh, with placenta insufficiency uh, underlying. So this I've already described. Then a, a case for the preterm, I've already mentioned from the pathophysiology uh, of the fetal heart that the, the baby. Um, sympathetic uh, system is still um, overpowering the parasympathetic because there is delayed maturation of the parasympathetic nervous system which occurs around 30 to 32 weeks so as a result preterm babies tend to have a high baseline heart rate and on top of that they have reduced variability and they may show some um, uh, variable shallow variable deceleration so if you see this kind of pattern for babies will be around 28 weeks, we'll be doing this in the FMU because we see this kind of cases uh, with severe preeclampsia. So if you see this kind of a pattern, uh, it is normal, physiologically normal for preterm babies because the parasympathetic system is not yet matured enough to balance the effects of the, of the sympathetic uh, nervous system. Uh, the case of meconium, I think what I want to emphasize because this since this presentation will be available on the YouTube, uh, probably to just emphasize that the issue of thick or thin meconium, uh, I know the teaching has been thin meconium is innocent, but we need to be aware that the same chemical components uh, which are in the thick are also in the thin, but it is the dilution that matters. So, uh, one baby could just be oligodermnus from probably one reason or another. The other one probably could have polyodermnus from one reason or another. They may poop the same uh, amount of poop. The other one is going to have thick, the other one is going to have thin. So uh, while thick, of course, uh, is probably the one which is more likely to cause obstructive kind of features in the airway than the thin, but the injury that both of them may cause at the level of the alveoli is the same because the same components that is the bile acid, the bowel sores, the enzymes, the lanugo hair, the venous calciosa, they are all in that meconium, all those substances. So uh, thin meconium babies still need to be closely monitored because they can still suffer from the effects of meconium aspiration syndrome and also suffer from the local effects uh, of meconium, such as um, 
ulceration of the skin or the umbilical cord causes spasms, and also the uh, it increased risk, risk of uh, choreomyelitis due to the inactivation of the phagocytes uh, by the meconium. Um, then choreomyelitis, choreomyelitis is underdiagnosed in our setup, uh, probably not in our setup, but maybe globally, because 10 to 15 percent of the cases are clinical. Then the rest are subclinical. That means these are histological choreomyelitis, which if we take placenta tissue to the lab, we are go there is going to be evidence of inflammation and infection at the level of the placenta, but without showing on the mother. So as a result, um, when you do a CTG, some of these babies uh, probably will present with one of the uh, following features. You may see that um, there is persistent loss of acceleration, then you may see some chemoreceptor mediated decelerations, and you may see barrel receptor mediated decelerations and also per persistent reduced variability and loss of cycling or saturated pattern. Saturated pattern means increased um, uh, baseline, um, increased variability above 25 bits per minute. And we may see uh, also a sinusoidal pattern, but this is common with fetal anemia. So, uh, if we see a baby who pro probably previously was okay in uh, probably uh, prenatally or a recent CTG was normal, but now when they're in labor, we can see that <coughs> there is an increase in the baseline rate rate from what you are considered to be normal. We should always keep uh, choreomyelitis at the back of our mind, especially for our women who come with a rupture of membranes, uh, more, more than 24 hours rupture of membranes, but with no features, maternal features, because subclinical is not going to show you anything both um, uh, on the mother and on the side of the baby, besides an increase in the baseline heart rate and probably some deceleration. So we need to have a high index of suspicion of choreomyelitis if we see that the baseline heart rate is increased from a prior non-normal um, uh, baseline heart rate. An increase I'm referring to, probably you've seen this baby uh, uh, woman before when she ruptured the membrane first time and did the CTG, and the baseline heart rate was around 130. Then when now she comes in labor two days down the line, you see that the baseline heart rate is now 155. That is an increase in the baseline heart rate, despite that it is within normal. But for this baby who is stable now, a heart rate of 155 is not normal. For this baby who had a prior baseline heart rate of 130 uh, uh, when you saw her earlier. Then fetal arrhythmias will give a confused kind of CTG appearance. So if you come across this kind of CTG appearance, you always need to be aware that babies could have arrhythmias just like adults, they have uh, arrhythmias. If you see this uh, during the antenatal period, you need to refer to FMU for a fetal echocardiography to make sure that there are no um, uh, fetal arrhythmias. So they need to be booked in the echo clinic, um, uh, echocardiography clinic. Uh, these babies, to, if, if it is in the antenatal period. But if they are in labor, then people need to suspect if she has not been done a scan, then we also always need to suspect that there could be underlying fetal arrhythmias. Um, then in terms of assessment, uh, it is important to, to know that when you are dealing with preterm babies, it's always a delicate balance. You want to balance uh, the issues of survival versus long-term outcome. Uh, whenever we we decide to fight for a baby's life, we also need to know uh, to consider the clinical picture. If it is a case of choreomyelitis at 26 weeks, it's a totally different war ball game to choreomyelitis at 38 weeks. So we also need to look at the maternal age and also the condition of the fetus. If the fetus is congenital malformations, growth restriction, that changes how we discuss with the mother and also the wishes of the woman and also her history, if she was struggling to conceive IVF and so forth, or previous preterm losses, then uh, this should be taken into consideration in the formulation of a management plan. Then uh, we also need to, uh, to be aware, uh, like we have already said, that the physiological um, response of a preterm baby is totally different from uh, that of a term baby. Uh, we will do gestation age specific response uh, in the FMU as we continue to learn on CTGs uh, to say how do we how does a 26 uh, 20, 24 to 28 week baby respond different from probably 30 to 34 week baby to 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 hypoxic stress because well, there are different differences for these preterms. This is probably something to we will do later. 
then we also need to, uh, to, to treat the underlying cause, uh, predisposed factor of uterine uh, <coughs> irritability, infection, intrapartum hemorrhage, antipartum hemorrhage, and also treatment of labor, preterm labor. Uh, if labor is, preterm labor is not advanced, if there are no contraindications, the desire to stop the labor, if preterm labor is not advanced. Uh, a woman comes probably one centimeter, two centimeters, and they have contractions. Uh, you, you, are, you have ruled out <laughs> evidence of infection. You might want to give tocolysis and to also give the baby some antenatal steroids. Sometimes you give tocolysis and to get away with it, the labor stops for sure. Sometimes it doesn't, but it will give you time to at least give the baby something and also to put antibiotics if you think there could be cases of UTI and so forth. Evaluate maternal risks of, of operative interventions. Uh, things like a Caesar, uh, sometimes Caesar at 26 weeks may, might not be the safest thing to do because you might end up having to do a classical. Uh, if you try to do it transverse, that will be messy. Uh, you might end up going all the way to the lateral, the uterine terrace, and you might end up taking the baby in a way that traumatizes it because of the small opening. So all these uh, issues need to be taken into account when we are dealing with preterm babies and also the issues of um, uh, future pregnancy, increased uterine rupture, if you section a 26 week or a 28 week, these things are happening, but you just need to put them in perspective. Then the potential fetal benefits, uh, then the intrapartum, initial intrapartum CTG. I guess, I guess. starting. Dr. Mazira, I'll, I'll come and join you. Right, sorry. Uh, then the intra initial intrapartum CTG, the normal and the abnormal. Um, so if it is normal, then everything is okay. We don't have to do anything. These women can continue even on intermittent auscultation. But for those who are abnormal, uh, with a fetal heart rate uh, uh, greater than 160, uh, with decelerations or meconium or reduced variability, of course, we need to look at the possible um, uh, underlying issues, uh, which we have already mentioned, things like infection, meconium aspiration, chronic hypoxia, antecedent brain injury. We need to look at all these factors. Then we can we have to consider expert dieting delivery. Um, then, uh, then we have the categories of our babies, which we have already mentioned. I think we've already mentioned what these are, uh, what is associated with this decompensated, compensated, uh, and compensated by stress feeders. As for the compensated and stretched fetus, probably um, uh, what maybe I have to, to emphasize that for these compensated by stretched fetus, uh, of course, they are not as uh, sick as the decompensated ones, but they will need to be watched because they, they will have uh, a, a, an abnormal baseline uh, fetal heart rate. They will have uh, fetal uh, variability may be normal. But you will see that they will, there is an increase in the amplitude of the deceleration and also the inner deceleration interval is greater than 60 with or without cycling. And um, ideally, uh, some people would do a second test of well being. But in our case, uh, risk assessment and also probably uh, evaluating the full clinical picture is what we will do because we are not going to be doing any fetal blood sampling uh, of sort, but we will be using CTG and also the patient's clinical history and how the labor is progressing to come up with uh, management decisions. And of course, the following should always be, be checked for uh, to make sure that there is no abruption, prolapse, uterine rupture. We should always uh, rule out all these underlying pathologies whenever we are faced with this kind of heart abnormality. And the pitfalls, I think I mentioned this last week uh, to, the, to the fetal medicine team, that these are some of the pitfalls that you may come across when you are doing a CTG. Um, let me come to this slide and say, uh, <coughs> we'll be doing some CTGs in the FMU, not all CTGs, most of the CTGs are going to be done in the antenatal ward, the, uh, the, the labor ward, and maybe early labor ward. But what's, what are the CTGs that we'll be doing? And what is the rationale? We are going to be doing CTGs for babies who are less than 32 weeks with abs and or reverse end their cellular flow in the umbilical or in the ductus venosus, because uh, these are the babies we are we want to know whether to recommend delivery or not. So we are going to do uh, CTG. If we see a baby with this, then we'll do a CTG. Then we are going to interpret the CTG together with the Doppler findings 
to know whether to recommend immediate delivery or we can continue fetal surveillance. Then uh, the greater than 32 weeks, those are absent or reverse end the slow flow in the umbilical artery. So that means if a baby comes more than 32 weeks, they've absent or reverse end the slow flow in the umbilical artery, we are going to do a CTG uh, for these babies as well. Of course, uh, we still we, we, we are still recommending delivery for these babies, but we, uh, we are not just a clinical unit, we are also a research unit. So we want to find out the difference, say what is really the difference between these babies uh, when you look at, at, at their data later. So we will be doing uh, for these babies as well. Then for greater than 36 weeks, uh, if we have an FGR baby after 36 and the MC is less than the fifth sender, or we have an absent or reverse end in the umbilical artery, we are going to be doing CTGs on this. I didn't put the umbilical artery here, um, uh, the, 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 the increase umbilical artery, because I thought if I put that one, we may not be able to cope with the numbers um, if we to, but it is worth it to monitor all these babies, but we will not be able to manage, of course, if we want to CTG all these abnormal, but there are too many. Then the CT duration is 20 minutes if the CTG is normal, but if it is abnormal, we may want to trace for 40 minutes, then we, we, we review the CTG, then uh, we, ca we, ca we, we write the conclusion based on that. Then this will be the indication for immediate delivery. Persistent blood cardiac only a previously normal cardiac features. Then prolonged deceleration of greater than three minutes. And um, flat tracing, absent variability, or uh, less than three beats per minute, we recommend delivery. Then the other CTG abnormalities, then the team has to consult the specialist in the FMU. If you see another abnormality, which are not the above. The above, we don't have to wait for the specialist. The moment you see this, um, then the delivery is to be recommended. Then I want, I, I just want to quickly introduce a concept called the pre-induction scan. The pre-induction scan is something we are starting, I think we're, we're starting at Sali, uh, starting next week, uh, where we, are, we have created a pre-induction clinic where all the, the women uh, for pre-induction uh, scans will be done. Uh, what is the aim of the uh, pre-induction scan? It is to identify fetus at increased risk of intrapartum hypoxia. And uh, in terms of the indications, uh, this will be high-risk pregnant women planned for induction by the, um, of labor by the obstetric teams. And the performance of the scan, the following parameters will be assessed. Please take note of this. Especially the, 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 the salute team while starting with the pre-induction uh, clinic. That we... We are going to be measuring BPD, head circumference, AC, female length, and amniotic fluid, DPS pool. Then we'll do the um, uh, umbilical artery the MCA alone. We're not doing doctors with no for this patient, the pre induction scan. Then we do the uterine artery door plus. The duration of scan maximum should be 15 minutes. So that means in a two hour period, you should be able to do eight patients. Uh, in a three hour period, you should be able to do 12 patients. Because this is a very short scan. You're not doing anomaly scan here. We are just assessing what is necessary for an induction to be done. I'm not saying if you see uh, ventricular megaly, you ignore it. If you see gastroscasis, you ignore it. But I'm saying uh, you are not going to try and measure the kidneys. You are not going to try and look at the face. These are women with term who are due for induction. And uh, our, this is just purely a pre-induction assessment. So this scan shouldn't take long at all. 15 minutes is the maximum for performing this scan. And how are we going to manage the scan results? If the umbilical artery and MC are normal, recommend cytotech for induction. If the umbilical artery is abnormal, do a CTG. If the CTG is normal, then mechanical induction is recommended. Uh, then CTG, we recommend CTG monitoring intrapartum. Then if the MCA is abnormal, CTG is normal. Again, we recommend the mechanical induction and CTG monitoring intrapartum. However, if both <coughs> the MCA and the umbilical artery is abnormal and the CTG is abnormal, we recommend delivery by C-section. We don't recommend induction for these babies who have both an abnormal CTG and abnormal uh, MCA and umbilical artery. I think this is the end of my, my slide. Um, I think I'll end here for, for today and open the room for, for questions. I'm sorry, I don't have much time to answer questions. I'm just in a meeting and I want to join the other colleagues into that meeting. Thank you, Dr. Verenga, for that um, insightful presentation. Um, any burning questions? If you can uh, raise your hand or just go ahead and give and um, ask the question.
Thank you. <coughs> I'm seeing six six chats. Um, <coughs> Ah, okay, so I think it was to do with the with the recording. Um, I want to ask something, Dr. Veriga. Um, uh -huh. induction scan. Um, mm -hmm. numbers three, four. Uh, when the umbilical artery doppler is normal, stage is normal, then we are recommending mechanical induction. Then later on, we're saying CTG monitoring intrapartum. Um, I think that's yeah. fine, but. I don't think we have enough yeah. CTGs to actually monitor all the patients who will be having this kind of recommendation for number three and number four. How are we going to use the CTGs? I'm not sure how many CTGs Salim Gabe has. Um, yeah, right, they are not enough, but uh, I think uh, when it comes to CTG, of course we will discuss the CTG protocol, but uh, we may not be able to continuously monitor, we may do more intermittent uh, 20 minute CTGs for some of the women who are in labor to just see if everything is okay. Um, but I, I, could, I, I, I couldn't find uh, another better pragmatic um, solution to this, to be honest with you, because there's no way we can ask these women to labor without any form of monitoring. If they have an abnormal umbilical artery Doppler, um so this is why i recommend actually this will be our basis for uh for asking higher life to give us more i will meet higher life at some point uh, probably next week then i'm going to tell them that the cities you gave us are not enough give us what we think is enough because they want to help in reducing both maternal and perinatal morbidity mortality then in that case they have to give us what is workable because one ctg is not workable in a labor with such as a labor with such as ours. So I agree that implementation will be a hassle, but this will be our basis to argue or to lobby uh, higher life to do more than that what they've done. Was well, they called me telling me that they wanted to buy some more equipment? Then we will meet next week to to see so that we can push them to buy more. And we told them that these are our numbers and uh, with what you gave us, it will make very little effect on the ground. I think they can buy more, to be honest with you, if we, if we you know, give them the reasons for doing so. Oh, thank you, Dr. Weringa. I'm uh, partly answered. I think, yes, uh, we definitely need more stitches. And also, I think, um, I think uh, maybe there has to be more stuff or buy in from the nursing staff as well. Uh, because even right now, when we don't have CTG monitoring, if you go to labor wards um, with, for example, intermittent auscultation, it's hardly being done on time because they say that they are busy, they are short staff. So I, now, if they have to actually do CTG for 20 minutes, whether it's intermittent or continuous, um, and also come and actually dispute the CTGs, I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I think we need to address both the CTG that we need to have more, and also maybe more so. Uh, hundred percent, hundred percent agreement with you. This is a battle, a regime battle, which has to go on actually. Um, but uh, the thing is, we can't, uh, we can't give up. We have to, to keep on pushing. Uh, Things will give at the end. Was I agree that on the nursing side, it's, it's a it's a battle, it's a battle of some sort. Nothing is easy actually for for us. So, um, you said that we face the difficult part, or we just see collapse and you know uh, die. <laughs> yeah. So I agree that it's a raging battle, and we have to be willing to to go on with this battle. I agree hundred percent. It's not going to be easy, but we will we will fight the battle before us and see how far we we win. Thank you, Dr. Verenga, for that answer. Um, anyone else who wants to ask um, questions to Dr. Verenga? Remember, it says he needs to join another meeting.
So now I don't see any hands up. Um, I think we can call it um, a day for today's meeting. Thank you, Dr. Averinga, for that um, informative um, talk on the CTG. We wait, we also await. Thank um, you so much. Hospital. Thank, thank, thank you. you. I think we'll